Man, what's going on, y'all? We at Fearless right now. We got the outreach going on, man. Y'all make sure y'all come here every Wednesday. Gracias por la ayuda que, que nos dan a toda la familia. But he's trying to tell you I love you because I don't want any more shooting stars. I need some shining stars. I need some people that will stand the test of time, that will keep going. No more fallouts in church. We need some solid people in the body of Christ that can love Jesus till the grave. Amen, amen. Okay, so we're gonna go to Mark chapter six, verse 30 through 44. Okay, I'm gonna adjust my... Okay, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. So, Jesus, so, so the apostles were on a grand, um, you know, like the Bieber tour, but they were on tour with miracles. They were just going all around and they were just doing this ministry tour, miracle tour, right? So they get back, they report to him all that they had done. How many know that um, when there is good leadership, there will be accountability? Can get a, get better, amen, at that. How many know accountability is healthy? And we see this, Jesus is making a big statement here. He didn't just send them out and say, I hope you finish what you start. Um, but he says, no, I want you to come back and tell me what you did and if you did it. So Jesus is savage here, you know? And he taught. So he told him all that, that the apostles said all they'd done and taught to Jesus. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and let's get some rest. So they all wanted to get some rest here. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go get some in and out and raising canes, and they can go to um, you know, the mall, and they can get the food they need and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. Turn your neighbor and say, it's you. Turn your other neighbor, you ignore. Say, you give them something. They said to him, all the reasons why that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Well, Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. And when they found out, they said, well, five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. They were organized, taking the five loaves and two fish Looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. He gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Then he gave them to disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. Isn't that the character of Jesus? He would just love to impress everyone. He said, I'm not just gonna feed the thousands of people. I'm just gonna give you a little extra to show you, guess what? I'm a more than enough kind of God. I'm not gonna give you just what you need and you're gonna be lacking. No, no, no. I give you more than enough so you can give it out. He goes, I'm gonna give all of them food and the disciples were able to pick up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000 and what a miracle. So, time my message this morning is the miracle is in your hand. Come on, just speak faith to your neighbor and say the miracle is in your hand. Miracles in your hand. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you want us to take part in the miracle. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are still doing the supernatural, reading about supernatural, and you are still doing it today. When I just think about my father two and a half years ago, who went from 0% chance of living, doctors told him he wouldn't be able to even live, his brain would be dead, his heart wouldn't be strong, he'd be on dialysis. But God, but thank you, Jesus, supernatural God, 
Lord, because thank you that my dad's heart is being strong. He's not on dialysis. His kidneys work perfectly. He's not brain dead. His brain is sharp, Lord. You are that kind of God. And I wanna help build the faith in this room, Lord, for whatever it is we're looking at. And we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on. Amen. 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 All right. So let's get into this. So I wanted just to set up a little bit of this story. And so the, the disciples were going and doing all these miracles. And, and what happened was Jesus, the Bible says, right before this took place, um, he went to his hometown. And do you remember the story? He went to his hometown and he wanted to do miracles, but the Bible says it's not that he wouldn't, but that he couldn't do miracles because there was dishonor and they just saw him as ordinary and they saw him as common. And because of that, they didn't receive the fullness of what God could do. How many know how you perceive God is what you will receive from him. If you perceive him as little, as you perceive him as small, as you think he can't do it, guess what? You will receive small and little and he can't do it. If you perceive him as he's great and he can do mighty things and he'll be faithful, you receive that. And so guess what? They didn't think he can do much. He's just a carpenter. Guess what? We're not going to get, he says, he says, I not wouldn't, I couldn't. Almost he was locked up because he couldn't do it. So can you imagine, can we just get into what Jesus would have felt like? How human Jesus is. Jesus is feeling rejected. He has to feel it just so, so sad. He was thinking, oh, man, they're going to brace me. This is my hometown. You know, I'm coming back and I'm about ready to do a little, I'm going to show my stuff off. You know, I'm going to do all the, all the stuff. And they didn't even, they didn't even receive him. Then Jesus's best friend and, and cousin, John the Baptist was killed. This is, this is a big deal. This is his closest person to, his, to him. And he was killed. The Bible says he's beheaded right before this story happens. And the disciples are coming and they just bury John the Baptist. And Jesus is grieving. He's got to be going through it. He's mentally exhausted. He's physically exhausted. He's spiritually dry. Have you ever felt you are just, life has just handed you a bad, I mean, we are just, it, I, I need to get away. Jesus says, I need to get away to a place and get some rest. And this is where we kind of find ourselves in the story. So the disciples were going to do the miracles where Jesus is going, let's get away. I just need to get some rest here. And this is what stood out to me. Go to verse 34. Verse 34, when Jesus landed and saw, everyone say he saw. He saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. So Jesus is making a statement that, that, that compassion has to be greater than my convenience. He's making a statement that I want to be more compassionate for people than I, I need to have my convenient life. I want convenient Christianity. I want comfortable Christianity. I want easy Christianity. But Jesus is here is going, no, no, no. This is what I want you to do. I want your level of compassion. Do you see? He goes, he saw because I get focused. I'm taking my kids to school. I'm, I'm taking my, my boy to soccer. He's like in club soccer. Anyone have kids in club club sports? It's a whole nother level. No, don't do it any, either. Don't don't anyone do it. It's it's demonic. And, and we do, we're we taking him to soccer and I'm, I'm taking Lyric to guitar lessons and then I'm taking Arrow to preschool. She's in preschool now. And and, and so and I'm going to meetings and I'm, I'm focused and I'm focused on doing everything. And God is saying, Christy, do you see? Do you see? Do you see the girl behind the register that looks empty in her eyes, that looks hopeless behind the register? Do you see the waitress that's helping you that looks like she, she doesn't have anything left inside of her and she looks depressed? Do you see the person that's sitting in your neighborhood that's sitting on her front porch drinking away her pain and she doesn't know what to do? Do you see the person that's walking by your cubicle every day at the workplace and they look dejected and they look depressed? Do you see? Do you see? Because you know what? I think this generation is asking, do you see me? Do you see me? And this is where we're at. 
Jesus was pushed beyond his physical desires to go, I'm just going to keep loving on people. The Bible says the crowds just poured in. I mean, they got there before, you know, there was no Twitter, there was no TikTok, dancing around, go, there was no, no Facebook, there was no, and I can't do TikTok, I don't know, I'm 41, I think it's, it's a, it's a crime to do TikTok after 40s, right? I can't dance, I can't, do you have to dance to do TikTok? No, what can I do? I just speak. I just, I don't know. But tick, is there, you know, Jesus, it's like if you found a celebrity coming, they all flock to Jesus is big time. He's like, before anything was out that, that Jesus, they just got word and they started crowding around and, and, and leaning in. They got there on foot before Jesus got there in the boat. How much passion. That is called revival. That is what revival looks like. They said, I will do anything to get in the room with Jesus. I will do anything. I will get through traffic like you did today. I will get through crying kids. I will get through not even getting a good seat or good parking spot. I just want to get into the house of God and hear his voice. I want to be in a generation that says, no, no, you don't have to go to church. Church is kind of old school. I'm going to do my own thing. I mean, in fact, Christy, I'm closer to God than ever before, and I don't go to church. Have you heard that? Well, so was Judas. But we all know where that story ended. Closeness does not equal fruit. We're judged by our fruit, not our closeness to God. And when you're planted in the house of God, all of a sudden you have to develop fruit because now I, I learn how to love my neighbor as myself. I learn how to forgive people when I don't feel like forgiving. I learn how to run and try to bring, bring, bring unity between people. I learn how to serve. I learn how to deny myself, take up my cross and follow Jesus. I'm learning to do these. I've learned how to have accountability in my life. So now this is what it looks like. This room. You guys catch it today. Oh, you had a lot of places you could be. A lot of things we could do. Eating some crumble cookies is one of them I would be doing because I just really like it in this season of my life. Amen. But listen, in LA, this is revival. This is revival. You are hungry to sit at the feet of Jesus because you know the power of two and three agree together. There I am in the midst and it shall be done. In the spirit realm, it is being done right now. It is being done right now. And this is what they did. And then there's a guy named Philip that just is really hungry. You have a guy in the group that gets really hungry. And I think he's saying all oh, the crowd is really hungry, but he's like, he's the one that's hungry. He's blaming on the crowd. He's going, come on, Jesus. It's all the, you know, Chick-fil-A's closed. I don't like Chick-fil-A. Raising Cane's is closing. And all these things are closing. We need to get them to get some food. And Jesus says this in verse 37. Can we put that up? Do we have it? But Jesus answered. What does it say, church? Say that sentence again. You. Turn to your neighbor and say, you give them something to eat. And we go to Jesus with all our prayer requests and all our problems. And to find out and realize that I can be the answer to that prayer request. There was a time in youth ministry where... Um, I remember a girl came up to me. She goes, Christy, I'm just down to my last $5. And um, I have a really hard life. I have, uh, you know, my parents are drug addicts. And I, I, they never buy new clothes for me. I've been wearing this outfit for a long time. And she says, can you pray for me? And I said, yeah. So I said, Jesus, God sent someone to give her the money. Lord, so she will have enough food to eat. Send someone to give her clothes, as my closet is totally full. Send someone to give her clothes. Can I just be honest? This is, this is what I'm praying. I, I, God, I know you're faithful and you're going to be good. So Lord, I don't know what it is you're going to do, but it's just going to be an awesome miracle. And the Lord interrupted me I, at that moment. And I don't say this many times in my life, maybe on one hand. He interrupted me and said, you are the answer to her problem. So I said, amen, really quickly. And I said, guess what? I, I know I, I'm supposed to be the answer to this. And I begin to pry for, provide for that need. But how many times do we miss, church, that we have the answer? We have the answer. If they need a friend, you can be a friend. If they need prayer, you can have that prayer. If they need finances, if they need, what, what, what can I, how can I be? How can I be that person that is the answer? And it's like they didn't hear Jesus. 
Jesus. It's like they misheard him. And, and they begin to say things like, oh, well, this is all the excuses. This is why it wouldn't work. It would take over six months of wages to feed them. We don't have. And then we begin to give all our excuses to God of why we cannot do it and why it won't work. God, I'm not smart enough. God, I'm not good enough. God, what if I fail? God, look at how broken and messed up I am. God, Lord, I don't have the education. I don't have the resources. I don't have the connections. Have you ever said that to God? I have. Both hands raised. All the reasons. And God has gone, guess what, Christy? Are you really adding to my knowledge to tell me this? I am God. The reason I ask you a question is I'm trying to get you to realize what you do have. What do you have? What do you have? When Jesus is getting ready to do a miracle, he always starts with what you have in your hands because the ingredients for your miracle are always in your midst in seed form. They're always in your midst, but we miss it because we're looking for the bigness. But God's going, I don't get it and give it to you in the bigness. I give seed to the sower. I don't give a harvest to the sower. I give seed. Every dream he's ever given me in my life has been in seed form. I got a prophecy, Jeremy and I, 12 years ago from an incredible prophetic man. And he said, Christy and Jeremy, I want to let you know you're going to have a church of 17,000 people. Well, we get to LA and we have a church of 10 people. And we don't have a venue. And we don't have much to do. We don't have much resources. We don't. God gives everything in seed form. Guess why? Because he wants to prepare me to be able to handle the weight of what he's called me to carry. Oh, I know this is not popular message, but this is going to mature you this morning. This is going to help you because it's messed you up. It makes you think that God has left you and God has forsaken you and God has forgotten you. But he's trying to tell you, I love you because I don't want any more shooting stars. I need some shining stars. I need some people that will stand the test of time, that will keep going. No more fallouts in church. We need some solid people in the body of Christ that can love Jesus till the grave. It's a seed, and I don't think the seed comes because God doesn't want, God can't just give me that. He can give it to me anytime He wants to. The seed is, the process is for me. The process is for me. He's burying the seed, He's burying me in the ground, He's putting the dirt on top of it. I feel like I'm in a, I'm in a dark room. Have you ever felt like you're in a dark room? Dark rooms develop the best pictures. It's okay. Let the development happen. They go through seasons. Seeds go through seasons. Seeds go through changes. It goes through the weather. It goes through storms. And God is testing you because he wants to entrust you with more. So don't devalue the seed. It is the ingredient that triggers the miracle. It's the ingredient that triggers the miracle. Don't devalue the seed. The seed. God cannot multiply what you do not recognize. God cannot multiply what you do not recognize. I remember praying for a house when we were younger in our marriage. And, and, and I was like, I would say to God, we don't have enough money. We want a house, but we don't have it. We are told, telling all the reasons why we couldn't do it. And God says, what do you have in your hand? And I remember saying to God, I have some money. And this is all we have. It's $3,000 in our savings account. So God, if that's what we need to do, we'll just give it to you. I remember that day like, like, like it was yesterday. We gave it to the Lord and, and we didn't have anything left. And we lifted our hands. We started crying. We go, this is what we have, God. This is our seed. And we're giving it to you. And I remember many weeks later, actually it was months later, we kept seeding. We kept being faithful. Because many times we seed one time and God doesn't give us something in return. And then we think that that seed wasn't important. Wow. Seeds get planted and they have to get watered and watered and nurtured and watered and weeds pulled. So we kept trying to be faithful in this. And, and many months later, $30,000, 10 times the amount that we gave came off the house and we were able to move into our first house in Modesto, California when we were very young. But it was the seed. God was going, what's in your hand? I remember praying for a baby. I remember crying out for a child. And I just said, what do we have to do? All these other people are getting pregnant, having children. And God goes, what do you have? I said, I don't have anything. I don't have anything, God. I was frustrated. And God goes, you have worship. 
you have your voice and I just begin to cry out I begin to worship God and I have to tell you y'all know I have three miracle children today 10 9 and 3 and guess what you have worship today you go I don't have much you have a voice you have breath in your lungs you can give them you go I don't know why God's blessing them and they're not blessing me well maybe the difference is that person said I'm going to give out of my lack and you've told God what you lack and God's go you have to change you got to see what's in your hands God I want friendships God just bring me friendships he goes you got to be a friend start being a friend God, God, I feel dry. I feel weary. I, I feel like I, I'm telling you all the things I've told God. I need refreshing. God goes, when's the last time you've refreshed someone else and you served someone else? Start doing it. As you begin to do it, give and it will be given to you. Press down, shaken together, running over. It will come back to you. It will not come back to you the same way you gave it out. It's more. It's more. It's more. Are you catching this this morning? What do you have? What do you have in your hands? We devalue the seed because it doesn't look like the harvest. So we think we don't have anything to work with. It will never look like the end. So what is it right now that God has put in your hand? And begin to nurture it. Begin to go, God, I trust it. I trust that you're good. I trust that you're going to be faithful. The Bible says there were 5,000 men counted that day. I'm like, why didn't you count the women? Come on. There were women, children. So theologians think there was probably 20,000 to 40,000 people. Do you guys really think there was only one boy that had a lunch out of 20 to 40,000 people? I mean, let's think about this. The disciples are going all around trying to get food, trying to ask people, do you really think it was only one little boy? But there's only one little boy that decided to give his little lunch to the disciples. And I wonder sometimes if we, if we look at our lunch and we go, you know what? Because I can't do everything, I'm not going to do anything, which is the very something that could trigger the incredible miracle that would take place. You don't have to do everything. He's saying you have to do something. He goes, what's in your hand? Because if we can all do what's in our hand, it will do some exponential things in our life, in our church, in our family. In fact, this church is is a testament to this. This church we're sitting in isn't because one millionaire handed us a check. It's because all of you together said, this is what's in my hand. Some of you, it was $5. Some of you, it was $50. Some of you, it was $5,000. But you said, this is my lunch. This is my five loaves and two fish. And guess what God did? He gave us a building that's 600 feet from the crypto center. He gave us an incredible, look at this. We don't, people, I go around the world and they don't think that, that this should even be. They, they can't even believe because it's a supernatural touch from God. He supernaturally touches what you begin to sacrifice and what you begin to give out of what you have. The ingredients came from a little boy that wasn't counted. Do you find that God always uses when you, when you feel, have you ever felt underqualified for it? what God wants you to do? Have you ever heard God tell you to do something you've like, really, me? You want, you want me? Do you, do you really know that I, I have paralyzing fear of speaking? I never want to get in front of a mic. In fact, I ran from this. I never wanted this. But God loves to use those that don't feel counted, those don't feel, feel like they're enough, those that feel like they've messed up. I hope I'm talking the right crowd because that might be a little of all of us. He goes, you're the perfect candidate for me to use because I want to show off my glory and I have to show it off through broken people so I can show, so I can be glorified. The world go, how could you do that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I could have never done it. I could have never come from that place to here, but God, but God has changed my life and turned it around. It's a parent. A mom and dad that packed the lunch. Any parents, moms and dads, come on, raise your hand up high. We're, we're, we're really tired, so it's really hard to even lift our hands this morning. We're exhausted. Good parents, awesome parents. Do you think 
that that mom or dad packing the lunch that day really thought they were packing the ingredients for a miracle. How much we devalue sometimes the job we're doing as a mom and dad. And I just wanna encourage you as a mom today, all the parents, I don't think they ever knew that we'd be talking about a story that would change all of history that I'd be sharing with you today. How many times we don't think that that's important, but I wanna let you know that it's so important that you're raising up this next generation of revivalists and legends and champions. Everything you do in your home, parents, everything you do, everything you speak, everything you do, everything you say is riding on the slate of who they are. You packing this lunch is big, it's important. We need more parents that pack some lunches. We need more parents like Mama and Papa Jay who have raised an incredible family, three kids who are loving and serving God because they never said ministry is more important than my children. They were okay with saying, guess what? My ministry is all of this. It's going to the call of God and we're doing this as a family. And they've modeled it their whole life and now all three kids are doing ministry today. My parents never said ministry is gonna be more important. We're bringing this together and I'm I'm gonna love on you and I'm gonna pack your lunch and I'm gonna show you that getting into the house of God. Every time parents, you bring children into the house of God, you are showing them and valuing the importance of being here. When you begin to tithe and you give to God, you are showing your kids it's important to be generous. When you begin to, to, to guard their eyes from what they see on television, you are helping them uh, guard their purity. When you start pray and praying and worshiping at home, you are carving in them a hunger and a passion for more of the Lord. When you begin to talk about people highly behind their back, everything you do, everything you say, how you serve God, you are writing on the slate of who they are. Parents, I want to encourage you, if you feel defeated this morning, what you are doing is so valuable. Don't devalue the seed. These parents were packing the ingredients for a miracle. So the Bible goes on to say this, that Jesus took this bread. And I could imagine the disciples going, look, Jesus. Hands up. I did everything. I told you. I told you we weren't going to have enough food. I told you this was going to be all we're going to have for 20,000 people. And Jesus, sometimes have you ever thought, we think that the impossibility excludes God from the process. This is where God does his best work. This is when God starts. You're coming in. You feel defeated feel like there's nothing left. Guess what God says? That's perfect. That's perfect because this is where I start. Just hand this to me. He goes, I want to do the impossible in your life. I want to do the great in your life. I want to heal your life. I know it looks crazy. I know you never saw it coming. I know right now you're just hanging in by a thread, but can you hand him the little? And God goes, I'm going to do a miracle with it. He goes, just give that to me. Hmm. There's so many that have come in, I feel like with a great need. God wants to show off. I think of my dad. I don't understand, now I understand why he's going through what he's going through. Let me tell you this, this isn't part of my message. God has power and purpose, yeah. right? But he has a plan. Yeah. And many of us right now, I sense that there's just this confusion and this frustration because you don't understand the plan. But God has a plan in all of it. God has a purpose in why he's doing all of the things he's doing. My plan when my dad was dying, he was on the parking lot ground. My mom called me, she said he had a cardiac arrest. My, my plan was I prayed and he'd get back up and everything would be fine. But God had a different plan. God had a plan that doctors would be amazed that he was gonna to come to life, that doctors gave him a 0% chance of living, that he came to life. God had a plan that people would message me all over the world and say, guess what, I've never even talked to God, but now I'm talking to God for the first time and I gave my life to the Lord. God had a plan the whole time and God not only has purpose and power, but he has a plan in it all. Come on, somebody can say amen to that. And he gives his one lunch. It's very impossible at this point. And you know, sometimes there's a management miracle 
there's management things. You know, you're like, God, I need health miracle. We just need to stop eating crumble cookies. We need to hit the treadmill. God, I need a financial miracle. No, we need to stop spending more than we earn. God, I need a miracle in my relationship. They're, they're hurting me. They're abusing me. No, no, no. You just need to break up with that guy. You know what I'm saying? There's management things, but then there's miracles where we go, I don't know what else to do. Have you ever been there? I don't know what else to do, but God, I need you to do something. So Jesus gave thanks. He said, he took the bread and the keys could come. And he gave thanks was for what was not enough. He didn't curse the not enough. He blessed the not enough. He began to bless it. He began to bless it. How many times have I cursed my not enough? How, complained about my not enough and complain about, you know, my kids acting like, you know, demons have entered them. And, you know, my, my, my husband, you know, because he's really messy. I'll do a big one for that one. And, and, you know, it, I, I, I complain because of the, you know, my job and I have this job and I never want, I didn't go to school for this job and I hate this, this job and the boss and, uh, uh, you know, the house, the people where I'm living, it's just terrible. And, and, you know, where, 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 where the money I'm making isn't what I want to make. And I'm just in the car I'm driving is a podunk, you know, car and it has a horrible engine transmissions broken. And we, we're destroying our seed. This is our seed. We're cursing the very thing that will be an ingredient to the miracle in our life. And I find that every blessing does have a burden. So I understand there's a burden in marriage. It's a blessing, but also there's a burden. And kids are a blessing, but they also have a burden attached. There's a blessing to having this church, but there's also burdens attached. But maybe the, the burden is overshadowing your, your eyes from seeing the miracle that's right in front of you. So God's going, give thanks. Don't you start blessing. God, I thank you, God, for my husband. Lord, I thank you, God, for my children. They're not where I want to be, but Lord, I thank you, God, that you've blessed me with kids. And Lord, it may not be the job I want, but Lord, I thank you, God, that I even have a job. Lord, I don't, I know it's not the money that I really want to be making, but God, I thank you that I have food on the table. Lord, I thank you, God, that I have a roof over my head. I thank you that I have a place to get from one place to another. I'm in this house today. You have a, a way to give thanks to God. And when people become ungrateful, we can become entitled. We can become entitled. We think everything's owed to us. Listen, we are not owed anything. Jesus gave me everything. I'm not owed one more thing. He gave his life. He, if he never gave me one more thing, so guess what? Now I'm just gonna give thanks. And the Bible says he took it and he broke it. He broke it. He gave thanks and this is what started the miracle, the breaking. Have you ever felt broken? Has anyone ever felt broken? Yeah. You're the perfect candidate for God to use. He wants to use the broken. Broken finances, broken relationships, broken marriage, broken health, broken past, broken dreams. He uses the broken things. Because there's a world that's going, I need help, I'm in pain. I'm hurting and you can go, guess what? I've been through that. Not only do I feel your pain and I can empathize because I've been through it, but also I want you to know you don't have to stay wounded and you don't have to stay broken. This is the miracle that the healing is not just for me. The healing is for people that are outside these four walls waiting and waiting to be healed. Fearless Online Church. Man, what an amazing day so far. Right now is an opportunity for us to give back. We've been receiving so much. I, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed from what's going on in this stream and what God is doing in this church. Proverbs 19, 17 says this, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deeds. This church, is all about reaching the needs of our city and cities worldwide. In fact, last year alone, we were able to pass out 2.2 million pounds of food. Come on somebody, that's a lot of food. We, we gave out food and we were able to pray for every single person. We also washed their cars, pretty much the modern day 
a version of washing someone's feet. Man, what an awesome experience that we've got to have through generous givers just like you. You may not be able to be here on ground zero level, feeding people, clothing people, loving on people, but you sure can be a part of this by giving your finances and lending in a sense to the Lord. And we know that you can't outgive God. I've found over 41 years of life that no matter how much I give to the Lord, He always gives back. He gives back so much more, no matter how much I release. I really believe that the spirit of generosity is alive in our generation. We need to meet people's physical needs so they'll open their hearts so God can meet their spiritual need. Would you help us do that? We wanna give out more clothing. We wanna give out more food. We wanna touch thousands more people. In fact, this year, I'm believing to give out four million pounds of food. Would you step out in faith with us? Would you become a partner today? Everything in life to get anywhere really takes partnership. Every one of us are here because of partnership. Life happens because of partnership. I have a dream that we would reach people's physical need to give them a spiritual truth. Who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in their life. That love that we so boldly profess as Christians. Would you pray today about your gift, whatever size, large or small, that you're gonna partner with us once a month to see God do something incredible in a city. You can sign up for Fearless Partners today. Why wait another day? Let's be generous like our God and watch that generous God while we bless others continue to fill our, our vats, our barns, our, our dream, our business, our family fuller than we ever could have ourselves. God bless you as you give today. Let me pray over your giving as I believe people are moved today to become generous and partner with the Fearless Partners. Jesus, we pray over this giving. We pray over these people that are so into this ministry. We, we say right now, God, Lord, as we lend to the poor, as we help those in need, Lord, that you would help those that are giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with us today. We hope that you enjoyed today's message. We hope that it blessed you and we hope that you have an incredible rest of your day. God bless.